We're often asked, when are you guys going to get into precision shooting? Let's start with definitions. Precision is the quality or state of being precise. Or put another way, it is exactness. To place 175 grains of lead roughly a thousand meters away into a target, let's say the size of a human torso, that requires skill, math, and the right gear. When we called our buddy Joe Dawson of Bruiser Industries to come out for some precision content, we figured, let's kick this off the right way and bring you a video on the gold standard. One of the most fielded sniper rifles in the world. The Accuracy International PSR. Well, he said it's party time, gents. So, party, party, we shall. Um, we are joined by a special guest today, Mr. Joe Dawson. We'll have him introduce himself in just a moment. Um, bringing you, as we talked and planned this out, we kind of figured out kind of a series of international guns is what we're about to cover over the next few weeks, including Britain and Austria and Israel and Switzerland. Like, man, we're doing like the Euro tour yeah. for the next month. It's gonna be pretty cool. Um, today, we'll be talking about Accuracy International, and uh, we, we will be breaking down just a little bit of history for those of you that don't know, because hot damn, what a cool company yeah. story. I mean, yeah. it's just fascinating. Um, so we'll give you a little bit of that, talk specific about um, one of their platforms that we have here. We'll take you to some kind of organic uh, intro to long range stuff that we were covering earlier. Yeah. Um, you getting me and Chris spun up on some fundamentals of long range. And um, and yeah, and then we'll do that. But So I guess before we do all that, maybe uh, intro yourself to the three people that watch our channel. And Perfect. Let's see. Hello, one, two, and three. Uh, I'm Joe Dawson, uh, head instructor, solo instructor most of the time of Bruiser <laughs> Industries. Janitor. Janitor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Admin all assistant. Yes. Uh, so uh, I did 14 years in the SEAL teams primarily on the West Coast, and uh, most of my career was spent, My I did about four years of that, four and a half years of that as an instructor. The first two was spent teaching basically a scope carbine, uh, land warfare, reaction to contact type stuff. Did a couple more deployments and then finished up, uh, very blessed to finish my career as the course manager and supervisor for our sniper course. Uh, during my career in the Navy, uh, definitely realized I stepped, I wanted to go I found out I enjoy long range, wanted to go test my skills, went and shot competitions, and uh, loved it. And so, shot competitively, shot a lot of PRS, uh, some dabbled in USPSA, by no means by some Grandmaster, and uh, IDPA, some, some multi-gun stuff, but sure. definitely brought that back as much as I could. And, uh, and then when I retired, definitely tried to go do a little bit of uh, corporate uh, project management stuff, realized that, How'd that um, work out? Mm. I did not want to die in a cubicle. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and so, oh, no. uh, definitely turned over a new leaf and qu left that job and, and doing this full time now. So 
So courses, uh, you know, long range courses yep. for those of you that see this and you're like, hey, how do we find Joe? Well, and, and also on Instagram, just Bruiser Industries, right? So at Bruiser Industries, yeah. website's www.bruiserindustries.com. Uh, info at Bruiser Industries, if you guys need to email me. There's contact forms on the webpage. All the articles and and videos we've done so far are on the webpage. So the webpage or Instagram is the starting point for you. Easy cool. day. All right, cool. All right, well, before we start jumping into um, Accuracy International, quick thanks to uh, Segar here for providing the uh, belts that we wear, wear around them hips. The belts. Um, I think we're both probably wearing the inner inner light, Vel inner light Velcro belt yep. today. If you have heard this uh, ad read multiple times, uh, that is the belt that we wear probably 90% of our uh, time. I'm 100% you know? of the time. Well, the only reason I say that is because 10% of the time I'm shooting, therefore I wear the emissary belt at that time. And then you wear the battle wagon at that time. Oh yeah, um, but I still wear the light belt. This is true actually, because it, uh, it is a system, very right? true. Um, we've done a couple reviews on their belts uh, prior to them sponsoring the channel. You can go check that out. We've got them linked below. Um, if you guys need to pick up any belts, Hit them up. Uh, 1911 Syndicate is code. Saves you 10% off the whole site there. And uh, they'll take good care of you as the dog makes some strange noises here. Okay, that said, why don't we kind of hit list who the hell is Accuracy International? Because it's a name that I knew prior to this, but it was not a history that I knew. And uh, I found it to be a, quite a fascinating story there. So Accuracy International, based in the UK, started by Dave Walls and Dave Cag, C-A-I-G, if I mispronounce it, I apologize. They were um, friends who were uh, basically engineers slash, you know, like to build things. And it actually started with, they wanted to attempt to build two Colt black powder pistols <laughs> and there was no blueprints or designs available. And huh. so through gathering pictures and, and pictures of the insides of the guns and the outsides of the guns online or through references and books, they basically built two guns and took it to like some expert at a show or something for rep for for these guns and the and the expert was like hey you know these are these are excellent examples of this pistol but you're missing one mark on this one side and they were like well we made these and he's like what and huh. and so they were like you should probably be making guns yeah you're pretty good at this as it turns out they ended up getting connected with a uh, championship competitive shooter in the UK and they already kind of working on guns for like their local gun club and stuff and and uh, and they were like he was like hey you should probably make your own bolt-action rifle and so they started with making competition guns mm -hmm. for competitions in the UK and then that uh, quickly moved over into hey you guys should probably make a some type of DMR type sniper rifle it was quickly picked up or it was picked up by more of the specialized units in the UK first. Mm -hmm. And right about that time, uh, after like the SAS, uh, some SBS, of those- SBS, we're picking it up, yep. We're, we're picking it up. The British, entire British military was looking to replace their old Enfield sniper rifles that had been in service forever. And so basically they ended up winning the contract with what was to be called the uh, Accuracy International Arctic Warfare or AW. Mm -hmm. and. That gun basically set the stage for, I mean, in my opinion, some of the most hard use, battle proven, purpose built. They, it wasn't, up to that point, sniper rifles were either service rifles like Enfields, Springfields, Mausers, that were then accurized to be sniper rifles. Sure. This was from the ground up built to be a sniper rifle. And to my understanding, this is all happening from a garage. Yes. And they wind up getting basically a military wide contract. And, and they like, had to figure out. Oh how to shit. Do it. <laughs> we better figure out how to grow out of our garage. Yes. Wild. And then you fast forward to is like a hey, 20, 30 years later, whatever the number was. I mean, I found this to be mind blowing 60 countries using huh. their stuff in their militaries. I mean, yeah. that's wild. Including units in the U S law enforcement agencies in the U S federal agencies, uh, I mean, they are a very prolific, widely used, I mean, mu without debate, probably one of the most standardized and accepted highest end sniper rifles in the world. Yeah. And then fast forward to uh, GWAT era, they wound up having the, the record for longest confirmed kill in combat, ironically with two back-to-back -back hits on two different Taliban insurgents uh, at, I wrote down the distance and I get it wrong, 2,475 meters. That was later broken, but at the time that was the longest confirmed kill, which is, uh, that's hey, a poke. you know, hey, that's a thing to have on your resume. Well, that was the longest for 10 years, wasn't it? 
I don't know the dis I, I don't I don't know the duration. I know it was broken like two and three times after that, but yeah, I'm I mean, not sure. Think about it. Built. At that distance, that's two and a half that's a mile and a half. Yeah. So it's they, impressive. Back to back impacts at a mile and a half. It's What's impressive. that flight time? Like fourteen seconds? No, I mean I don't know. I have to look at my book. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um yeah, pretty pretty wild story there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um well, why don't we do this? Let's kind of break this down a little in terms of so what do we have because obviously they have different models and yeah. different things going on so what so, do we have here the aw is probably the most iconic version of their gun just it it, it had a very uh particular look to it it, it was a, it, it was one of the first guns to act, utilize a bonded action which is the action is actually connected to the aluminum chassis and then the way it was built was is the action was bonded or glued to the chassis the chassis was an aluminum a big aluminum body that then had two polymer sides attached with screws okay. along the entire length of it the accuracy international aw then let it, both 308 long action and short action that's the arctic warfare the arctic yes. warfare okay that was replaced, I don't remember the date, um, within the last 10 or 15 years, uh, they started releasing what was called the AX. Mm -hmm. And the AX started to incorporate, basically, the AW, when the, these guns were first produced, there wasn't as many night vision optics or ne need to mount as much modular stuff on a sniper rifle. Sure. You didn't have lasers or pecs or, or night vision or any of these things. And so, basically, they, they didn't need to put a bunch of stuff over the barrel. Fast forward, and now we have night vision devices, yep. lasers, you know. Uh, Thermal, all th yeah. That, yeah. And so the stuff like an enclosed forend started to become really popular. And so instead of putting a bridge over an a the AWs, which then became a thing, they ended up in doing this enclosed forend. The AX was around for quite a bit. And then the US military started to look at switch barrel rifles for their new sniper system. And the ability is, is that you can then, and there's something that I talk to a lot of people about is when you have something like a 300 Win Mag, a 300 Norma, a 338, the barrel life on those guns is only 1500 to 1800 rounds. Mm. And so if you go and you train a lot and a sniper becomes really familiar with his gun, he set up for him, trusts it a lot. What happens is, is it, it doesn't take a lot when you, a sniper school course might be six or 700 rounds or 800 rounds of that barrel life. And then all of a sudden you've half life the barrel before you ever get into pre-deployment workup, deployment, et cetera. Sure. If you have a system that you can then rotate to a 308 barrel, now you've quadrupled the barrel life and somebody can train and, and do a, get a lot of work on a gun set up the same way, you know, with the same optic, with the same feel, and then switch back to something that's bigger. And it saves the, the le huh. lower round count barrels for the more the longer range stuff, mm -hmm. you know, deployments, that kind of thing. Well, and if you're, I mean, military doesn't really care about the ammo budget, but hey, for your average shooter, they're probably like, hey, I'd probably rather. I'm assuming, hey, some 308 is going to be a lot cheaper to shoot. Or than... you end up working where, let's say, you're working with an NSW unit, and they have a lot of 300 Win Mag. You can set your gun up a 300 Win Mag, and then you go work with a bunch of Marines, and they don't have 300 Win Mag, but they have 308. M118 or yeah. AB, AB39 or something, or you go work with the Brits and they're shooting 338. you can then change this gun over to configure it to run any of those calibers. So the US Smart. military was looking at this and it, initially it was called the PSR, the Precision Sniper Rifle, and they put the bid out to the industry and AI bid, Sako bid, Barrett bid, uh, Kdex, and so when I was at the schoolhouse, I was actually, I actually took part in a couple of the sh test days for these rifles. And this was by far my, fa my personal favorite. Um, and they were sold, this one is called the AIAX PSR because it was for that contract. And it was sold as a kit by Accuracy International. Mm -hmm. This is currently set up as 308. For me, typically it's set up as 300 Norma. Um, I ended, was ended up getting it and it was sold in a kit with three barrels, 308, 300 Win Mag, and 338. Damn. Three magazines per caliber hmm. a different bolt for each caliber and this big deployment case like a toolkit a drag bag and uh and so that's what this is yeah. that contract ended up shifting over into the asr and barrett ended up winning with their uh mrad okay. but th that's what pushed the development of the switch barrel system within ai yeah boy very very cool yeah um let me ask you question because we didn't really talk about it earlier but it was one thing i wanted to know so there's long action short action and i don't really understand the difference so if you look at something like a 300 win mag because i think you mentioned you have both 300 win mag a long action is 
the receiver is long enough to accept Magnum cartridges. Okay. 300 Win Mag, 300 Norma, 338, and that requires a longer bolt and a longer magazine. So this is actually, it, it, this is a magazine for a different rifle, but this is a long action magazine. So it's long enough to take these. Mm -hmm. But you can, what you happens is if you have a short action, you have a shorter bolt throw. It's a lighter gun because it's a shorter receiver. And so if you're shooting something like 6.5 Creedmoor, 260, whatever, you then run short action because you end up with a smaller package. Think AR-15, AR-10. Sure. You don't need as much gun if you're shooting a smaller cartridge. Right. Sure. What, the, what they made with these is, is they made some guns and they make these type of magazines for this. They take a long action magazine. Hmm. And it's hard to see on camera, but they basically make an insert that takes 308 uh. rounds inside of a long action magazine. Okay. Okay. So then I can convert this to the much smaller caliber and still shoot it with the same bolt feel, same everything. Mm -hmm. And then I can change the bolt out because it changes the bolt face to something like a long action and then take the different magazine and everything else is the same, but the barrel, bolt, and magazine. Got it. And so you can shoot 6.5 Creedmoor all the way up to 338 Lapua on the same gun. Man, that's wild. Okay. It's very, pretty cool. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, anything else we should know about that kit? Or, or, or AI, you know, your th thoughts on, you know, I'm sure there's people watching this going like, man, you guys swung for the fences on, on, on the first precision gun that you had out there. And you're like, yeah, we thought this would be kind of cool, you know? AIs, and you know, I coming from a background where I got into precision rifle and, want, and shot a lot of customs, and there's people will get on, it's one of those guns that you either love or hate. Some people don't fit them well. And I think that's a great thing about building a custom rifle is that you have the opportunity to find a soccer chassis that fits you. Something like AI is you're you've got what you've got, and there's some companies that make some modifications that you allow you to change some things, whether it's a rail or a buttstock or something. But really, you're buying a complete gun. There's not like you're buying an action that then you can change over into a sure. hundred different chassis. And so, the other nice thing is a Remington 700. We were talking about this earlier. Is a two lug, and so. The, re the receiver itself or the bolt itself has two lugs mm -hmm. that then lock it into the action. And right. Required to lock it is 90 degrees 90 degree of bolt movement. Look at you! Look at shit. you! The AI is three lugs. 60 degree throw. And so what you, you have a reduced Learning throw everyone. of the bolt because now you have three lugs that need to rotate yep. to gain full lockup within the receiver. So it ends up being a much faster feeling receiver because it doesn't require as much movement of the bolt to lock and unlock the lugs. Why wouldn't everyone do 60 degree cost or what? Cost, the Remington 700 is a super old style of receiver. Yeah. And at, by the point that we have just used it all, I mean. Everything. It's it's still being used on oh, no Mark doubt. 13s and stuff to this day. Sure. And it's been used since, you know, Vietnam, M40A1 all the way through, so. Just kind of a legacy thing. Yes, yeah. I mean, they've changed things like, even on Remington 700, you change extractor styles, you change the bolt handle, you change where the bolt's released. All of those things are already incorporated into an Accuracy International. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really interesting about these guns is, especially on the AW, they did something that, I, I, somebody else might have done it, but I find it interesting is, the receivers can always be returned to factory new. And what I mean by that is, the lug faces that lock the bolt in, right? On a Remington 700, a custom action. What it is, is it's part of the receiver itself. In an AI, AW, it's a pressed in collet. And so at any point you can press out and press in a new collet and you now have brand new, cause think about it, metal on metal eventually is gonna wear down. Sure. You can't wear out an AI action. And Jacob Bynum of Rifles Only down in Arizona. This was fascinating. Has a rifle <laughs> that he's put something like 27 barrels through. Yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah, 27 barrels, which would equate to son of a, well, son of a bitch. A um, 308 barrel will get between eight and 10,000 rounds on barrel life. Yeah, so, so we added it up as like 200,000 rounds. On the same receiver. That's insane. So, and that, and it's a, his is just an old AW. And so they just did some really cool things to make it. Now what you end up with is a package that you can't wear out. It, everything is, you can just order a barrel from a, from a shop, a gunsmith. They send it to you. You don't have to have it headspace. You don't have to like, it's just basically install, guaranteed headspace mm. and run. The triggers are all Smart. held in by Allen keys. They're not pins, they're not. And so operator level maintenance, 
AIs really have it figured out. And they've just, they've just been doing that type of purpose-built tactical firearm for a very long time. Yeah, and go figure that's coming from the UK, of all places. Yeah. You know, not a, not a super friendly country to firearms. Well, it's just funny that, like, you know, the British military or British like, in military industrial complex couldn't come up with a good gun, but two guys in a garage came up with one of the most iconic sniper rifles on the planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah that AW is in every video game ever since as long as I can remember as a kid. I mean, the, the AX incredible. 50 or AW 50 is in the current Call of Duty right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, very, very cool. Super cool. Well, I guess we will uh, take you guys to some long range footage of us uh, training and trying to uh, learn a little bit earlier. If you guys are looking for any ways you can support the channel, just check out 1911syndicate.com. Um, you can learn about what we do. We're a real estate business. Um, we are like kind of a normal real estate business. We just do it with really cool people, a lot of mill, LE dudes, gun guys. If you like this channel, you're we're the kind of real estate agents you guys want. Um, and then check out the newsletter as well. That's on the site. That'll bring you a lot of good info, behind the scenes, you know, kind of product launch stuff, and then real estate news, that kind of thing. And then Patreon's linked below. You can guys go learn about that. And then before we get into the long range stuff, also check out Joe's site if you guys ever want to train some long range stuff. We've got courses coming up and all that fun jazz. And that's it. We'll take you to some training content. Let's go. There's some inner, the things that people get out of order is going to be how you set up the gun. And the th there's important things, then there's a sequence of operations to kind of setting up a gun like this. Uh, what, and it all starts from your length of pull. And the length of pull is going to be the distance from the contact point with your shoulder and the front of the grip. And there's a quick and generic way to do that, which is to hold the gun up and you're going to bend your arm at a 90 degree and you're going to place it so that you have the butt stock basically contacting your bicep. You have a solid grip on the gun and you have your trigger finger has a nice 90 degree break. But what you're trying to do is, is people go, well, I want 90 degrees. The relationship is actually, I want this bone, the vertical bone in your finger, to be parallel with the bore of the axis of the rifle. And that's how I kind of dictate where my contact patch is. Because what happens is, is unless you can grow the grip angle, if you and I have big old hands, like you might get that 90 degree, but then to get to where everybody says you have to have that pad of your finger, it's, this pad, it's right here, it's right in the middle, it's the only place you can put it on a trigger, right? What happens is if you have long fingers, even though your length of pull is correct, it starts pushing that, that angle away from the gun. Yeah. And then trying to get that joint to bend and mm. pull straight into the rear becomes more difficult. Sure. Okay. Now, once I get this length of pull, this feels comfortable. I'm like, okay, cool. I got a good grip. My trigger finger's in the right place. Yep, that's comfortable. I don't feel like I'm super tied up like this with my bicep. I don't feel like I'm like way out here where I really can't get any support with my elbow. Then I set up the rest of the gun. That then starts talking into where this goes. And so that the eye relief now is what we're gonna start worrying about next. The eye relief is gonna be the distance between the back of the ocular lens. This is the ocular lens, this is the objective lens. Between the ocular lens and your eye. And every optic has a actual like distance, like a engineered distance and it's actually kind of a range. It's like 2.5 to 3.2 inches. Mm -hmm. So there's like, you'll find the front of the eye box. That's what it's called, that range and the back of the eye box. And so what I always do is I kind of lightly mount this, the, this, the uh, scope mount. I set the scope in it, put the rings on it, but I kind of keep all the rings loose so I can move it up and down. So the scope isn't gonna fall off the, op the gun, whatever. I mount the gun and first what I'm gonna look for is I'm gonna kind of hover my cheek. So let's say this starts all the way down. Okay, so if I look through this, I'm like looking at the base right here of the, of the scope mount. So I'm gonna raise it up a little bit. Okay. And once you start to see, like even if you don't have proper eye relief at first, what you're gonna start to see is you're gonna see a circle of the, of like what the image should be. I'm like, okay. So the image is still in the bottom of the optic. Okay, so I'm gonna give it a little more. Okay, what I'm looking for is a nice, clean, crisp edge all the way around the sight picture. So there's no fuzziness, there's no shadow, it's nice and clean. If I don't have that, then I'm gonna start to move this forward and back. And what I like to do is, is it'll be, it'll be clear, crispy clear, and then it'll start to, cave in and then it'll go move back or move back towards you. It'll get clear again and then it'll kind of fade away. Where it's clear, there's gonna be like a little zone where you're like, okay, that's clear, but that's still kind of clear. 
I want to be as forward in that zone as I possibly can. And the reason for that is it's prone is going to be the position where your head is farthest forward on the stock. Okay. And so as I start to stand up and shoot off a barricade or a tripod or something else, then my head is going to shift back down along the cheek piece. And so I want to give myself the most the zone. error. Okay. So basically I go okay. forward until it's like, okay, I push it forward. I'm like, okay, wait, yep. No, nope, that's fuzzy. And it's right there. As long as I can get it equal and I'm good, that's where my scope goes. Tighten all down, get on the gun. Now you're gonna check your natural point of aim. The, when you mount this though, there's a couple of relationships that people, everybody wants to know what this is, that scope level. So I like to have my scope levels right here. Um, there's a couple things that have to do with that. There's, they make them so they mount to the pick rail, they make them so they're in the scope base and they make them so they mount to the optic. The relationship that we're worried about is the reticle to the level. So the reticle is vertical when this thing is centered. It actually isn't as important, the optic to the gun. Now you don't want to have it like, you know, like this, but some guys will cant the gun slightly. This one has an adjustable buttstock, so I can actually loosen this up and kind of change the angle. Hmm. What they'll do is they'll do the same thing with the gun and then put the optic on it. But as long as this is true to this, like we're good. And the reason for that is, is we're looking for repeatability over distance because one degree of cant at a thousand yards can equal 10 inches of deviation. The human eye cannot see one degree, especially since what's straight out here. Like we're all not Jake. We're, <laughs> We're on an angle. You know what, I'm gonna give it, that was pretty that good. That was a good one, <laughs> that was a good one, right? I'm gonna give you that. One. Scope selection tends to be one of those things I got asked about a ton. Like I have a 308, I have a 6.5 Creedmoor, I have a 223 LPBO gun, what scope do I get? Like, hey, I wanna shoot, and I go, how far do you wanna shoot? And they go, well, I wanna shoot, you know, max I'll ever shoot is 300 yards. I'm like, then the max you'll ever need six power. And they, the rule for that is, uh, Alex at Ridgeline actually came up with a hard number. I kind of had my, amounts that I usually told people, like power ranges, but he said two times the number of yards you want to shoot. I say one and a half to two. So if you want to shoot 500 yards, you need between seven and 10 power, starting magnification. If you want to shoot a thousand yards, you need 15 to 20 power, mm. starting magnification. Okay. Um, and so this typically is set up as a 300 Norma, which I call like a mile gun minimum, like 1600 yards. So 1600 yards would be between 20 something and 32, and 32 power. This is a Vortex Razor 6 to 36. Okay, there you go. So, okay. good job, Jake. I'll sign off on yeah, your okay. scope. So I, <laughs> I agree, I think you ticked well. So you're just, it's where the reticle is etched inside the optic. So first focal is the zoom in reticle. The reticle gets bigger or smaller yeah. with the distance you're shooting. Yeah. And why that's important is, is if, it, if the reticle stays the same size, but the image gets bigger or smaller is, the, is the, the measurements of the reticle the same? Like, no. well, dude, you're 0 0.2 mils. And it's like, well, yeah, at seven power, whatever. Yeah. And then, but, but it, hey, now you're 6.2 mils. Did you change size? No. But if the reticle gets bigger or smaller with magnification, then it is proportionate to the target size. Mm -hmm. And so first focal plane is nice because you can use the subtensions in the reticle at any magnification. Mm. Yeah, okay. and it's the same, same, because the measurements are the same. So hmm. in, well, you guys will see, like when we start shooting at targets, like I'll shoot all those targets out there at 15 power. Yeah. And the reason for that is like, what happens is the six to 36, 500 yard target, you zoom all the way in, that reticle looks like it's doing this. That's and people right. are like, yeah. I want it to go off now. And they fucking sink one, you know, low left or whatever, because yeah. they're, just putting too much input into the gun. You back out a little bit mm -hmm. and that reticle movement gets cut down a lot. And people are just more able to like calm themselves down and take a more precise shot because mm -hmm. they're not trying to time some enormous movements. Sure. Uh, so we have a couple different op reticle options here uh, that you can or can't see. We've got basically your standard mill grid and then something like a Horus H59. So all the information mm -hmm. now so building a position on a gun, uh, there's a lot of things taken into consideration. And when you're doing it hasty, a lot of this is terrain dependent, what you're trying to do. If I was shooting up, if I were up there and we're shooting down the hill, we're tr this is talking perfect world, 
flat range, flat position. How perfect can I get behind the gun for consistent behavior of the, the, the rifle and its rounds and everything else. So you're starting behind the gun. I'm gonna center myself behind it, basically directly between my legs. And now I'm gonna lay down. We call this as supermaning out. So I'm just, I'm centering the gun dire directly in front of my body. My legs are evenly spaced. They're splayed out. I'm trying to get my heels on the ground. So as recoil goes down our body, it wants to take the path of least, least resistance. And so if I start turning, it's, it's going to affect how the recoil is taken by, by the gun. If I center myself behind the gun, lay my heels as flat as I can. Some people can't and they start having knee issues and stuff. Right. Dude, you do the best you can. But if I can, get my knees against the gun, center it up behind my body, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna scoot forward a little bit. I'm gonna pull the gun up into my cheek. I'm gonna get behind the gun. So from behind, my spine should be basically, the gun's gonna be slightly off center of a of, of vertical spine. And then I'm pulling the gun into my shoulder and getting on the optic, right? Okay. Once my position is great, now I've got two arms to deal with, and what am I doing with them? Firing hand. I'm worried about the grip of the gun, my elbow placement of the firing hand, and then where my trigger finger placement is. Mm -hmm. How I build my position is I do it, I, the easiest way I think, I think through it is go, I go shooter, scope, shot. So I'm gonna worry about the shooter first, body position, natural point of aim, uh, shooting, shooting arm position, grip, finger, trigger finger placement, support hand placement. What am I doing with it? Make this hand work for you. Like you'll see some guys try to shoot and they're doing this. I have a bipod up there. What the, what is this hand doing? Mm -hmm. Nothing. What I've got is I've got my rear bag, back of the gun, which is then going to affect the elevation as I try to go up or down. I'm just gonna squeeze and use the bag to change the elevation of the reticle, right? Yep. I have the shoulder, the stock is, the cheek piece is high up in my cheek. So I don't have to be like craned forward. I don't have to be craned back. I'm not, my head isn't, I, my neck isn't uncomfortable. I can just get on the gun. And my sight picture is there, right? Natural point of aim is, that with using body position and the rifle setup that I don't have to fight against my setup. Sure. If I mount the gun and I get on here, and I close my eyes, I get on the gun, I should open my eyes and the reticle is perfectly clear with crisp edges. And if, I, if the gun was to recoil, I'm not jumping to two or three feet to either side of the target. It's coming back down in a predictable manner that then I can manipulate the bolt and be right back on target, Okay. right? Support hand. The thing is that people watch a lot of people do is they, this bag doesn't have to be oriented this way, this way, this way. It's made to be flexible for a reason. And so what you do is depending on where I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna make this bag work for me. I wanna try to get a good amount of the bag underneath the gun. And there's percentages, 60, 30, it's shooter side away. What you find is, is like, that's great for zeroing and stuff, but like on this ground, how it's uneven, whatever, what you're gonna find is you're gonna find, you're gonna need the position you're in is gonna predicate bag position more than anything else. And every bag is slightly different too. This bag is very different than that Armageddon gear over there. This bag's a little more maneuverable. That one is made for shooting off like barricades and stuff. And you're gonna run into where you're gonna have to use like, maybe if I was trying to shoot up that hill, I might just be using the little, little corner and, yeah. to try to get that angle. Yep. It's like, I don't have 60, 30. I'm only using like 10% yeah. of the bag. So you add takeaway as needed. Yeah. yeah. And so, but what you don't want to do is, is people start doing, they have too much and they're trying to get low and they're getting pissed. I'm like, dude, move the bag, man. <laughs> like the bag doesn't have one orientation, yeah. right? My position is now is good. Now I start worrying about the scope. And so with the scope, there's a couple things you gotta worry about. So one is gonna be magnification, parallax adjustment, and then it's gonna be your wind and elevation. 
And then finally, you get bubble up. And so you're gonna go, hey, I'm looking for that target, cool. It's up on that hill. Okay, I see it, I wanna be about, okay, I wanna be about there, cool, yep. And then now my, because I'm look, I've changed distances, my reticle is super out of focus. So now you can change the side focus. So now I've got my side focus is set, cool. I'm, I've got my magnification's where I want it. I've got nothing on on wind. And I go, okay, now how far is that target? That target is 747 yards. So I go, okay, I'm gonna make elevation five mils. So now is your choice whether I'm gonna dial. And I'll go, okay, I'm gonna, uh, right now I don't, I'm not pressed for time. I'm gonna go, elevation is good. Okay, cool. I'm on target, I'm on five mils. Elevation's good, magnification set, my parallax is adjusted. I'm gonna I'm gonna bubble up. Cool, my gun is up perfectly up and down. And now it's a wind call. So it's like my, my the shot the scope's gonna be like I'm gonna hold about a half a mil. Got my trigger finger placement on there. I've got a two-stage trigger. You're gonna get take up that first amount of slack. Then we get into our breathing pattern. Our breathing pattern is gonna be breathe in. The gun should move perfectly vertical. How I tend to do it is I tend to go down. A lot of some guys kind of force it up and they and they try to let the gun fall in the target. The more natural thing is if I'm on the bag, as I breathe, what's it gonna do? Raise my chest, right? Mm -hmm. Which is gonna make the gun go up, which push, pushes the, the back of the gun come up, which makes the front of the gun come down. And then I can breathe and kind of fall into the gun, which means the reticle is gonna be rising on the target. Mm -hmm. So. There's nothing in here. Close the bolt. I'm on that target. Half mil wind hold. You're gonna the shoot. Coming up. Yeah. At that last second, at the resting heart rate, break the shot. It. You should have a momentary pause. The thing is, yeah. you don't. It should be getting there right as you're getting to the bottom of the breath, because that way you can make fine adjustments during that three to five seconds before your brain starts to look for oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so depending on your fitness level, whatever, you might have a little more or less, but like you, what you don't want to do is, is breathe out and you're beneath the target, left target, right of the target, whatever. And now you're trying to make bold adjustments and then get your wind hold correct. And then on a small target, you're going to then start like, your brain's going to start going like, yo dude, you need to take another breath. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you really want to get back on where you go. So as that breath is settling, you're settling into where you want to do it. Make any last minute adjustments and then trigger break. Okay. Okay. Going hot? Send it. Nice shot. Low? Yep. I jerked that one. You also see what magnification you're on? Yep. Should I go higher? No, I'm just saying like, people always want, they always think they have to be at 36 power. He's at like 25. No, at 36 there's too much movement. Yeah. That gun shoots. How bigger is that target he's shooting at? Inch? Uh, yeah, the from edge to edge is an inch. Okay. The middle circle is half an inch. Okay. The drill's pretty good. There's your half a See? tenth left, but I jerked that you one. had to fuck it up. Yep. I mean, I, I was happy with those. Yeah. That last one yeah. I tried to hold for your half a tenth left and then I threw the round, but. That's all me. Oh, no, don't chase the group. Like you, you, you adjust, don't, that's what the last thing you want to do when you're shooting groups is because again, you're adjust, you're trying to eliminate the equation. Mm -hmm. If the zero is off, but you shot a 0.3 group, like then adjust the scope. Okay. But what happens is, is that is people go like, it's not centered. So I'm going to hold, but then I don't have a group to adjust that's you it. on. That's exactly what happened. And that's why I threw that one. So aim in the exact same spot every time because cool. then you go dude i shot a really tight group so we know it's not you and then we can then address the i mean dude you're talking a tenth the half a tenth yeah i was just trying to show off a little bit and that uh blew up in my face
Yeah. How'd that one feel? That last round? Yeah. Yeah. About the same as the rest, honestly. <laughs> well, oh. <laughs> you, threw it about an, you threw it about an inch. Yeah. Okay. You had a four shot group going that was really nice. It was great. Then... Oh shit, yeah, that's way off. Yeah, that was impressive, Jake. Good job, dude. Yeah, that last one's way the fuck in the middle of nowhere. And that's one of those things of like learning to call your shots. Sure. Like where, where was the reticle when that shot went? So now let's build some position. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we'll go back to you. We'll adjust it back out. Cool. So you're gonna build your position on the gun, stand up. We're, gonna, we're just gonna do for the sake of simplicity, that first line of small dots. Okay. You're gonna take one round per dot. Yep. So left dot, stand up. Next dot, stand up. Okay. Next dot. Cool. Shooter, stand by. Engage. Right target, leftmost dot. Top, top row of small dots. Nice shot. Bolt back, stand up. So that was a great shot, super stable. Uh, the goal for this is to be, to break that shot, it, it is, is to be sub 10 seconds. Cool. Shooter, stand by, engage. different sequence being a lefty. All right, bolt back. Shooter, stand by. Engage. The secret is if you look at it, yep. like your group, I would make an adjustment for, but I'd make a different adjustment for Jake's group. You guys are both on the same gun. 